let's take a look at this simple vulnerability in Adobe Reader. So, as you probably already know, Adobe Reader is an extremely common application for reading portable document files. Hopefully you already know what PDFs are, but if you don't, or if you're a digital archaeologist watching this video a thousand years from now, PDFs were an extremely complicated data format that lent itself to having lots of exploitable vulnerabilities. What you might not know is that PDFs can include JavaScript within them, and Adobe included a JavaScript interpreter based on Mozilla's. Now, there was some pseudocode and data structures made available by one of the references that I cite, but unfortunately it didn't quite have enough background and, you know, specifically some of these functions like remove key from cache or, you know, where this function overall is called, there wasn't quite enough context that I could just let you free to try to find the flaw in this. So instead I'll just very briefly describe it to you. The Adobe JavaScript handling code maintains a cache in the form of a binary red-black search tree. So the cache starts from this root node and it points at a BST node. The BST node has a left parent and right. So I'm not going to fill in everything here. So you can just imagine that, you know, if this thing is the root of the tree, then there would be a left and right. The lefts would point up at the parent, the rights would point up at the parent, but I'm not going to fill in the pointers for those. This is just to say, you know, as JavaScript objects get created, these cache nodes get created as well. They're balanced into a red-black binary search tree. Within that tree, there is a field that is the cache key. And so the cache key to sort of indicate, you know, what does this node represent? There's a pointer to the PD doc, and that is basically going to be the data from the PDF document of some sort of internal file object within the PDF. And then there's the E string. So the E string name points at the E string data structure type, which includes a type, a buffer that points at the actual data. So the type can either be one, in which case it's a ANSI data found in the buffer, so just typical string, as you would expect, ABC with a null terminator, or if the type is two, then instead it's pointing at Unicode data. So two byte representation for each character. And then there is a pointer back in the cache to the ESO object, or sorry, ES object. So this would be an eScript object. eScript, I assume, represents ECMAScript. ECMAScript is the standard on which JavaScript is based. And so this ES object is going to be just a typical C++ object. So the fundamental bug that existed in this implementation is that when the object itself was deleted, so just in JavaScript, if you remove references to something, then it's marked as available for garbage collection. But once this object is garbage collected and it's been freed, then there's a need to go and find the node in the cache, find the tree element, and free that tree element again and, you know, rebalance the binary search tree and, you know, delete that element from the cache. So the core bug that occurs here is that after something is freed and it goes to start searching through the cache, unfortunately it always uses a Unicode type when it's trying to see if the name of the thing that was just deleted matches the name that is referenced by a particular BST node. What that means in practice is that it's going to fail to find this and then it's going to leave a dangling pointer to a thing that has been freed. So let's see that. Let's imagine that there was a node in here and it had a type 1 NC string ABC. What happens is first this object is free. So the object is free and that means at this point after this is freed and before this is deleted this ES object pointer is a dangling pointer. So this is the sort of Damocles dangling, you know, potentially spelling the doom of this code. So what happens then is in comes a search to try to delete this node and get rid of this thing that has the dangling pointer within it. And it's always searching for a Unicode string. So it comes in and it goes to the first node and then it goes here and it says, is that the right thing? Nope, it's not. Move to the next node. Is that the right thing? Move to the next node. Is that the right thing? Nope, none of them are, and so it can't find it, and it says, well, I don't know, nothing I can do about it. I'll just go ahead and leave all of this binary search tree alone. What that means is that this object will still be sitting in the cache and having a dangling pointer. So if there's ever an attempt to access this object based on this name, then it'll say like, oh yeah, I totally found that. Go ahead and send you back the pointer. And so that looks like this. All right, I need to access an object named ABC. Goes in, looks at the binary search tree, goes over here, and it says, yes, looks good to me. This is the BST node that we need to find. 
then it says, here you go, here's the pointer to the ES object for this particular object with this particular name. And it hands the dangling pointer back, pointing at some freed memory, which of course we know the attacker could control. So that right there becomes acid at the attacker's leisure using the typical games for heap feng shui and whatnot. And now any use of the C++ object could instead be an attacker controlled object. And if they have, you know, full arbitrary control over the contents, then of course they can overwrite things like C++ virtual function tables, which are just function pointers. And therefore, if a function pointer within that ES object is called, it's actually going to call into fully attacker controlled location. So what kind of use after free is this? Well, it's not exactly an AC free C because this is not going to occur because of a completely attacker controlled pointer. Instead, it's more just a buggy free C. It is a free of a pointer. There's a sort of logic bug that allows for freeing that ultimately is going to cause a dangling pointer to still exist somewhere in the code. So free occurs, boom, the victim disappears. Now the attacker has to play their typical games to make sure they fill that in with attacker controlled data. And then there is subsequently going to be this dangling pointer in some legitimate code. And the usage of that dangling pointer, of course, will burn the legitimate code. It's going to have all sorts of problems. So what was the fix for this? Well, unfortunately, it was proprietary code and there was no patch analysis done by the researcher, so we don't know. All right, now just to say that this uh, citation one is the original author, the original discoverer of this vulnerability, talking about the nature of the bug. But I used primarily this second reference, which is a third-party description that goes deeper into the nature of the bug and nature of exploitation.